<coughs> Bless God. Uh, I have, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I appreciate the, uh, the leaders inviting me. I, I have received quite a bit of stick, though, from the poster that's been circulating on Facebook of this <laughs> meeting, where, uh, do go and have a look at it later if you haven't already seen it, where I do look like a stage hypnotist in that picture. And I imagine it's been, it's been projected here for a few weeks, and so most of you are, of course, already under my spell. <laughs> and um, if I click my fingers, you'll fall asleep and think <laughs> that you're Barry Manilow. <laughs> so I won't click my fingers. I might do it at the end, though. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean that, I've had more internet traffic over that than anything in my life here. So thank you. I mean, it's not as though <laughs> uh, my normal selfie pose was available in many thousands of other pictures. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, why don't you turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 1? Uh, I noticed that um, there's no meeting tonight, which pr presumably means you're anticipating that I'm going to be rather long. <laughs> uh, well, I saw the side come up, no meeting. I thought in brackets, obviously should have been. <laughs> should appear. Uh, yeah, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I might clear my throat a bit today. It's all right, though. It's not a sign for you to be hypnotized. Um, uh, this will be a little bit Christmassy, but as you know, there's only, in fact, there's less than 11 months to go. <laughs> right? And, uh, in fact, uh, I know exactly to the day how many shopping days there are till Christmas. You can ask me any time of the year. Uh, no, it's true. Uh, you can ask me any time of the year and I'll be able to tell you exactly uh, how many shopping days to Christmas there are. That's the kind of guy I am. So, Anyone want to ask me now? Yeah, yeah one. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. Verse 5, you all with me, say aye. aye. Okay, here goes. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, you with me? Okay, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Uh, we're going to look at some of the details. Verse 6, look at this. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Did, did you see that? So whatever version of the Bible you have, it's going to say something like that. They were upright. Uh, they observed all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, Verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well on in years. Verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And by the way, I love Luke's little detail here. Standing on 
standing at the right side of the altar of incense. You get that little detail? When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Uh, I think he was every right to be afraid of that. Uh, I believe that the angels, by the way, come to uh, take us home when we go to be with the Lord. I believe there's enough in the Bible to suggest that if, when I'm about to pass away, the angels of God will come for me. They take people to Abram's side. They are sent in the last days to gather the elect. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, so if I was in the temple and I was well on in years and an angel appeared, <laughs> I'm about to miss Christmas. <laughs> it's always fun when someone says, oh, I keep seeing angels. I say, well, God bless you. <laughs> anyway, he was gripped with fear. And you would be, wouldn't you? But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. I want to talk about that. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. Now, these are old people, right? You get that? And you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth or right from his mother's womb. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn, now what a wonderful ministry this is, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And don't we need that today? That fathers' hearts would be turned back to their children. They wouldn't have to be found by the Jeremy Kyle show anymore, right? <laughs> they, would, they would find themselves. And the disobedient, this was his ministry, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. John was going to turn disobedient people back to the wisdom that came from the righteous. In other words, an enormously powerful ministry of change. Fathers were going to love their kids again. And people who didn't love God and didn't love morality were going to love morality again. It, I mean, don't rush over these verses. What, what a man he was. He looked strange. He ate strange stuff. But what a man. Jesus said, of all born, none greater than John the Baptist. Hallelujah. And he's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, Excuse me, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man. And my wife is well on in years. Uh, I suspect he thought she possibly might have read this in the Bible later on and didn't want to go too specific there. Verse 19, the angel answered, I, I love this. What a great verse. Great verse for preachers. Great verse for any communicator of God's word. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now, some bad news, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true. When will they come true? When? At their proper time. Meanwhile, the people outside were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he couldn't speak to them. 
They realized he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, nearly there, he returned home. After this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant. And notice this, notice this, for five months, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Father in heaven, we ask you now that in these next moments that the Holy Spirit will so wonderfully blow through this room, blow through our spirit, blow through our mind, Lord, blow through our understanding. We have not come uh, to play around. We haven't come to merely fulfill a duty or a service or a ritual. Lord, we've come because we believe that our God speaks. And Lord, we want to have ears that are able to hear. And so we pray, Lord, that, 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 Lord, it's not that you are unwilling to speak, but sometimes we are not clear to hear. Lord, make me a vessel of your word and, and make those who hear me now here and later on on CDs and things, Lord, and online, Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. In the name, the wonderful, gracious, and all-fulfilling name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a great story. I've just enjoyed reading it, really. That's, I read it so slowly, I was enjoying it. And, uh, but I think it's full of wisdom. I, I'm a, uh, I, I've got a reputation of often speaking from the Christmas passages, uh, because I think they are just some of the best parts of the Bible in terms of amazing truth you can get out of them. And uh, because they're Christmassy, we tend to confine them to, in, well, I mean, in some places, a 15-minute word after a whole lot of carols, you know, and, uh, and we don't really talk about these stories very much. But um, here are three or four things. Let's see how we do for time. Here are three or four things that I think come out of this wonderful passage that are absolutely applicable to all of us in terms of how it is that we should conduct our lives, how it is that we should approach and understand God. So let me just launch out. Number one, it seems like that we are called to be very faithful uh, even in times of disappointment. Um, I don't know whether you noticed but the story ended, that last verse that I just read, verse tw um, 25, ended with a very old woman looking back over her life and considering that she had had decades of disgrace. Do you remember that word? The Lord has taken away my disgrace. Now, uh, to be unable to bear children is painful in any age and for any couple and for any lady or, or in, indeed the man. But particularly in this era of time where to be barren was to be considered under some sort of divine disapproval. So if you're not able to conceive children today, you can have some treatment or you can have some sympathy uh, 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 either way, your doctor won't tell you, well, this is a curse from God, for example. And you won't think that. Nevertheless, in this particular era of time, that would have been sort of pretty much the prevailing idea that, that the Lord had closed somebody's womb off. And of course, you can read that, can't you, in the Bible a couple of times. And so here is a lady who cannot bear children. And of course, the disgrace is also with her husband because you may have noticed, if you've ever read the Bible from cover to cover, that the Bible loves to tell you who begat who and who, who begat what and when. And so they were big on the family tree, you know. And so this idea that you would pass on your inheritance, and very, very big to these, to these Jewish 
people in this culture. This lady had led, and, and her husband, let's, I don't want to take away from him either, years of disappointment. Which is why I want to take you to one verse that's so important to read. And I made a meal of it earlier. I want to make a meal of it now. It's verse 6. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But, verse 7, they had no children. Now, uh, without getting too technical with you today, if you were able to look at this in the original text, you would not find a break, you would not find a sentence break, you would find one singular sentence. They were, uh, uh, they honored God with all of their lives and they had no children. Sort of, right? You with me? There isn't a sort of a, a, a and by the way, now a new paragraph. We haven't moved now on to chapter 2 or episode 2 of the story. This is one, in the original, one singular uh, statement. And of course, that's, uh, uh, that's an issue for a Bible study more than today. Both of them were righteous, observed the Lord's commands, blamelessly having no children. And so here is the first thing I think we learn from this couple that part of being holy is responding well to life's disappointments. Everybody can sing when you're happy. Can you sing when you're sad? And I'm not the kind of preacher that thinks that Christians are permanently happy. I understand that many times Christians are sad just like everyone else can get sad. Things go wrong. And here, we're not talking about, for, for Zechariah and Elizabeth, we're not talking about that the Wi-Fi wasn't very good. Now, are we? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that the price of petrol has gone up. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about like we're having, there, there are currently three men right now digging up our garden at home. Right now. They're not looking for bodies. This, that's not what they're claiming. Uh, last year, how much? Uh, oh, well, we checked this before. Last year, we had a burst pipe and we poured 14,000 pounds of water into the garden. It looks lovely now. I mean, it really does. The <laughs> grass is really very green. Uh, and it's happened again. So, right now, things are going wrong. But we're not talking about that sort of thing. We're not talking about that your car hasn't passed the MOT. Look, come on, let's face it. Of course your car isn't going to pass the Look at your car. <laughs> of course it's not going it's not, it's not to. It's, it's not some sort of satanic attack. <laughs> 2018 will be wonderful, but it will also be brimming with challenges. Won't it? Is it all right to tell the truth? It'll be brimming with challenges. And really, our holiness, our sanctification, our closeness to God is perhaps, unfortunately, but it's true, best revealed in the rain, not the sun. That's where we find out who we are, isn't it? When does Jesus find out who he really is? When the Spirit <coughs> has led him into the wilderness. And by the way, it wasn't the devil that led him. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. As soon as he was baptized, if we can use that phrase, but for the purpose of sidestepping a bit of theology, I will. As soon as he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he is led into the wilderness by God. 
And you might want to think, I don't know if I really want the baptism in the Holy Ghost, if that's what happens. But we find out who we are when we're in the wilderness. Disappointments come. Now, we can, be, we can have disappointment, but we mustn't live a life that is disappointed. You get me? Disappointment must be an incident in the diary. Disappointed must not become a character feature of you. But it can happen. Where things are so wrong. But I want you to notice this couple. Life long pain. Emotional pain now. And you know, let's be clear that to be physically unwell is a phenomenal challenge. To be mentally or emotionally unwell is a phenomenal challenge. And not so visible. Can you say amen? Not so visible. But sometimes equally powerful. Lifelong pain. Now, I want you to compare this. With the story of Job, for example. Particularly Job's wife, who he possibly regretted marrying. Because when terror struck the life of Job, the kind counsel from his wife was this, why don't you curse God and die? How many of you think that maybe the romance had gone out of that man? <laughs> I mean, had she said, uh, why don't you curse God and let's go off for a weekend in Wigan? Maybe that would have... <laughs> but die! So when disappointment comes, you see, there can come this thing. Sometimes... Listen to me now. Sometimes being a Christian will make disappointment harder than if you're a non-Christian. How many of you understand that? Because if you're a Christian, you know someone who could prevent this. Whereas your non-Christian neighbor doesn't think that. Your non-Christian neighbor thinks that they were once a monkey. No, but they do, don't they? They were once a monkey. I mean, not personally. Because it depends, unless you live next door to the zoo. <laughs> to be a Christian means this that there is a God and He could heal me. To be a Christian means this there is a God and He could have warned me. Or He could have stopped this scenario. Everyone understand? That's what being a Christian is. Understanding that there is someone greater than the circumstances. And so there, there can come a challenge for someone like Zechariah and Elizabeth because they believed in a God, the God of Abraham and Sarah. And the God of Abraham and Sarah and the God uh, of, you know, back in the days of Samuel, cured barrenness. Yes, they knew these stories. Why hadn't God cured them? It's not as if they didn't have an understanding of a God who could heal a barren lady. The Bible is full of stories of God healing barren ladies. The first healing miracle that ever occurred occurs in Genesis 20. The healing of a whole household of barren ladies. When Abram prays. So here's the thing. Not so much what will 2018 be like. Because we know what it's going to be like. There will be some good days and some bad days. But what will my response be like? Ah, now that I don't know. But that I can decide today. I am not going to curse God and die. I'm going to bless God and live. Whatever befall, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. 
it is well. The car may not be well. The bank may not be well. The pipe in the garden <laughs> is not well. Positively demon-possessed. <laughs> Part of being holy is dealing with heartache. Now, everyone in this room, listen, we've all messed this up sometimes. So, we're not talking about what we've done. Let's talk about what we're going to do. And, and there'll be things inside you that say, Lord, why? And, and you'll all be polite here. And we'll all be polite during the singing, but there'll be a bit of, Lord, why? Why? And there will be questions, and they will be answered, but maybe not right now. The question is not, why has this happened? The question is this, how will I respond? The question is for us to answer, not for him. So they were very faithful in disappointment. Don't feel no disgrace today. Feel no judgment today. We've all had times where we haven't really responded terribly well to being disappointed. But we must never shake our fist to the Almighty. That is the supreme temptation that Satan puts before Job in that that's what he really wants him to do, to fall out with God. And disappointment will come along. Listen to me. Disappointment will come along, and part of its, uh, if I can personify, I'm not meaning to personify or demonize it, because things go wrong. It's nothing to do with spiritual forces. But if I could personify it, the purpose of disappointment is so that you will fall out with God. You mustn't do that. They were blameless. Number two, in our lives, what I think this story may teach us is the need to be absolutely open to divine interference. When we read the story, there's a real odd bit in it. Well, it's all a bit odd, isn't it? But verse 9 is the bit I want to look at here. Just for a second, he was chosen to go into this room <laughs> by hours of thoughtful prayer and wisdom, <laughs> by prophecy and reflection. No, 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 Jeffrey. <laughs> by lot! And we don't mean the lot from Genesis brought back. Or some kind of, oh, Lot has returned. <laughs> By Lot. Now, uh, again, we won't unpack the Bible study of what that means, but let's put it in our language. They rolled a dice. <laughs> Who's going to go in, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's roll the dice. Oh, it's five. Oh, it's you. He said, well, now this is, this doesn't feel terribly spiritual. Here's the spiritual bit. God fixed it. That's the spiritual bit. God fixed it. He, he cheated. <laughs> Didn't he? he cheated. It was going to be a four. And the, the window got, oh, it's a five. Now, it wasn't actually a dice, but you get the spirit of what I'm trying to say. One of the things that happens sometimes in the Bible is this, and it doesn't happen quite as often as you might think. It's where God behaves as though he is a God. <laughs> no, but you know, and can do anything. Most of the times, God is seen, is he not, as just really an a onlooker, his sovereignty is there, but he doesn't often mess with things. He'll send a prophet to go and tell people, you shouldn't have done this. But here, he messes. 
And I love this. And uh, one of my other favorite books in the Bible is the book of Jonah, where this happens quite a lot. God sent a storm. God prepared a fish. God commanded the fish, and it vomited him out, right? At that point, you want to be glad if you're Jonah that God can speak whale, <laughs> or whatever it was. God provided a vine. God, provi God made a worm that ate the vine, you know, where God just seems to be like totally in charge of things. Here's the thing. Their lives were absolutely open to divine interference. And I want to suggest to you that their lives were open to divine interference because they were blameless and kept all the Lord's commandments and decrees and were upright, you see? So we're not talking about having a private genie. We're not talking about a God that gives us three wishes here, as some Christians seem to think of God, that he's their servant rather than we're his servants. Well, what's God going to do for me today to bring me to church? You know, I had a student uh, last week, came to my lecture ill. And then I was maybe, I, she thinks I was rude to her. Of course I wasn't. And she said, oh, she said, I came to your lecture and this is how you repay me. I'm thinking, I'm sure that's not really the deal, is it? That I have to repay you. <laughs> but sometimes we can be like that with God. That somehow God has to reward us for our attendance or reward us in some way. God doesn't have to do anything. We are here for his glory. He's not here for ours. Nevertheless, as they continue to serve God blamelessly through their disappointment, here's what happens. God knows where they are. God knows their number. God wants to bless them. God knows he can use them. You see, you see where this is going? This is all going towards John the Baptist. Do you get that? That's where the story is going. A man who's going to change his nation, at least temporarily. Arguably forever. God messed with the role of the dice. Here's what isn't revealed. Zechariah doesn't know. And so when God, and so here, let me come to our lives. When God messes with the dice of my life, he's not necessarily going to give me a notification of it. He's not necessarily going to send me an email to tell me that he is going to do it. The angel does not appear Early in the story, the angel appears later. So here's the question. How many times, even when I feel disappointed or discouraged or another word beginning with D, just to make it three, <laughs> disheartened, how many times in that era of my life, or that era of your life, is in fact God working secretly behind the scenes all the time. But without sending you an email to tell you. Because he wants to bless you. He doesn't need your thanks. He doesn't need your awe and your gasp. Sorry, I'm in the north of England. Gasp. <laughs> he doesn't need that. I wonder how many accidents that we should have had last year, but we didn't have. I wonder how many times that traffic light went red. And you were rebuking it commanding it, flashing your lights, <laughs> shouting, come on. Because I, I think you'll find electronics works just like this. If you shout, come on, it's bound to change. <laughs> <laughs> if 
By the way, everybody, lads particularly, I've, I've, I have definitely learned the way to make the traffic light change. You put your handbrake on and relax, and then immediately you'll go. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that true? How many times has God been at work? How many times will he be at work this year? And we won't know it. How many times will he mess with the dice and cause us to be in the right place at the right time and... And yet, they didn't come out because someone gave us a prophecy and told us what to do. It didn't come out because we had a feeling. It didn't come out because the Holy Spirit is telling me to do it. We, God just did it. God just did it. But anyway, here's the second thing. When God does mess with the dice, when God does give them a little dose of divine interference, here's what they get. You ready? A baby. A baby. Have you ever had a baby? It's a piece of cake, isn't it? It's a blessing. You know, a couple of hours work. Sorted. They had a baby. Look, we don't know how old they are, 70s, 80s. They want grandchildren that they can love and then send back. Oh, God, please, will you bless me? Please have your way in my life. Are you absolutely sure? Am I absolutely sure? When I pray a prayer, oh, God, I'll, I'll go anywhere. Really? India? <laughs> Lord, I'll go anywhere. Lord, I'll do anything. All I have is yours. All for Jesus. I surrender. Wonderful. Here's a baby. How much work will it take? About 25 hours a day. See, I just wonder. You see, God, God has not, God's got great things for this nation, hasn't he? And what God is going to do is he's going to move on people and it's going to be extremely inconvenient. Come on. It's a blessing, but it's inconvenient. I love that little bit in the Bible. Where is it? Where they, he says, oh, you've been faithful over, over this much. Now, you will, now I'll put you in charge of five cities, you know. Now we learn in the Bible, what is the reward for good work? I tell you, more work. <laughs> you say, well, I'm going to just faithfully look after my five or four talents. And now you're in charge of London. <laughs> I wonder if you... See, they were open to divine interference. See, when you see that, you think, hallelujah, I'm open to divine interference. Are you really? Are you open to... What about if it involves moving to Wigan? <laughs> what about if God calls you to Swanwick? What about if it, if, if it means moving to France? And by the way, I mean the north of France. What might the interference mean? Hmm. He gave them a baby, but he gave them a lifelong disruption to their plans, didn't he? Was it one revivalist said, what does it mean to get on the cross? It means I have no further plans of my own. If you were nailed onto a cross, your plans for the day are changed. Number three. Here's a third thing I think comes out of the story. I think they were prepared, or we should be prepared, if they weren't, for God's long memory. Do 
Do you remember that little line? The angel appears, and it's in verse 13, and he says this, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Now, everyone just look at me a moment. Imagine this. I want you to imagine that right now, the Lord were to appear here on the platform, look at you in the eye and say this. I've got good news for you. Your prayer's been heard. Now, I wonder what that would mean for you. What does that mean? Your prayer has been heard. Now, the temptation might be that for you to think, well, the prayer that maybe you prayed a few minutes ago, the prayer that you prayed last night, but that's not what happens here. These are prayers that were prayed eons ago, at least in human lifespan. We don't know how old these people are. So we're going to, I'm going to surmise that they're in their 70s. They may have been younger than that. They may have been older than that. But let's just pitch it down the 70s track. Everyone happy with that? We're just, we're just going to pitch it there. At what point would you have stopped praying that you could get pregnant? 68? <laughs> 58? 48? At what point would you have said, can we at least say that they possibly had not prayed along these lines to any degree of intensity and faith for 20 years? So, what's the date? 2018? What were you praying in 1998? What were you praying on a Sunday in 1998? I mean, can you even remember? And maybe, actually, after 20 years, you may even have changed your mind about what you wanted. God has got an incredible memory. Now, of course, It's not really a memory, is it? It's the fact that he knows everything. But I want you to, I want to encourage you today for families here, for individuals here, for people who know how to pray and for those who know how to be desperate and therefore to pray. No, you don't feel like you're a great prayer, but you've known enough suffering for you to cry out, oh God, come deliver me. Come help me. I want to encourage you today Every prayer is kept on file. God has not lost a single email that came out of a desperate heart. And his memory is incredible. In as much as those things prayed for, do you remember what the angel said? And I, I tried to highlight it to you. These things, verse 20 will come true at when? Their proper time. There is a proper time. It's like, of course, as I've been working at the Bible College, many of the, I'll say young women, but it's also true for the men, but um, many of the young women believe that the time has come for them to get married. I mean, obviously, to the nicest guy in the college. And they're all thinking it. The Lord hasn't revealed anything to the nicest guy. (laughs) Only that he's very busy at lunch times. (laughs) He is Mr. Right! And sometimes I have to sit down and say, guess what? There is, whether or not there is a Mr. Right, we'll we'll leave that theology aside for now, but definitely, sometimes Mr. Right is not Mr. Right now. Everybody wants Mr. Right now. 
Everybody wants a blessing that's right now. Has to be now. Father, move right now. Lord, now. And I've found this. I don't know about you, but I've found that God does not possess a watch. It doesn't matter how many times I tell God I've got to know by Friday. God has no calendar. He has no uh, uh, real knowledge of my need that at five o'clock I've got to know. That, that just passes him by. Because my demand for everything to happen right now is not God's uh, heart. God does things one time and one time alone, and that's this. He does things at their proper time. Not at my time, at, in, in their proper time. Now, everyone will have heard this kind of thing preached before, but can you see, I want you to notice this, it's not fate that's happening here. It's God has collated their prayers over, over decades, but answered at the right time. I'm not talking about fate. I'm not talking about, well, what will be, will be. I'm not, because uh, that, that's just synchronizing with sort of worldly myths and putting God's name on it. We don't believe in fate. We believe in prayer and answer to prayer. And answer to prayer comes according to God's will and according to God's time. But here's the thing. You see, some of you may have spent weeks and weeks, months and months, years, pr you know, praying about something. And in the end, you think, I'm just going to quit. I can't pray about this anymore. Now, now I might want to encourage you in two areas. Number one, I might want to encourage you to pray without ceasing. Whoops. But even if I didn't encourage you to pray without ceasing, let me encourage you that God has stored up all that prayer in his heart. And there may come a sudden moment where all of a sudden everything just falls into place. I find Christians are like that. They, they, they can have seasons of great spirituality. And then just when they're maybe not so on fire for God, when they're getting a bit lukewarm in their faith, the blessing of God comes. And, and you, you can scratch your head and think, well, Lord, when I was fasting and when I was really seeking you, these things didn't happen, but now they're happening now. And I, I don't feel so in love with you as I did. And part of that could be because God is now sending what you prayed for 20 years ago. It's incredible, the ways of God. Everything's on fire. Don't let delay dishearten. And here's the final thing to say about this. Sometimes in the Bible, the longer the wait, the more wonderful the outcome. Remember what this story is about? It's not about the happiness of two old people. Although that's not irrelevant to God. It's not just about, although it is a bit about, but it's not really primarily about the, the disgrace being taken off an old lady. What it's about is John the Baptist coming and the hearts of fathers being turned back to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. One time I did a teaching class on how to know the will of God and on the third and final class, I showed up with an envelope and I said, inside this envelope is God's will. For, if anyone who takes this envelope, you'll open it and you're going to read a word. And that word's going to be for you. Who wants it? Well, everybody wanted it. Which was unfortunate because I spent the last two weeks talking about don't fall for phony tricks. But anyway, they all wanted it. <laughs> In fact, I brought along three, just to add the, you know, heighten the tension of the moment. Three, three of you tonight could discover the will of God for you. Three of you. Who wants it? Well, they all wanted it. And they all opened it. Inside it, there was one piece of paper. They all had the same, of course. It said this, one word, others. That's the will of God, others. If God's really going to give you a baby, it's not really going to be for you. It's going to be for others. If you say, well, Lord, I don't know what you're speaking to me about. I don't know if this thing is really about, if this is your will or my will. I can tell you there's one simple way 
that you can work out if something is really from God. And that is because while it's going to be a blessing to you, it's primarily going to be about others. General William Booth, it is said, once sent a one-word uh, sermon in a telegram because, uh, because it was so expensive. He was told, preach a message, but make it one word. And the word was, others. And there are things we've been praying about. And I'm telling you this, if these things we're praying about mean a blessing for others. I, I, I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless you. But remember when Satan took Jesus up a mountain and he said, you can have the whole world. That was a temptation, not a blessing. Can you say amen? amen? You can have everything you want. That's a sin, not a blessing. Others. God had an incredible long memory. And, and the longer they waited, the more wonderful it was. I can only... Of course, reference back to the book of Samuel where exactly the same sort of thing happens. Or Joseph's great long journey in Genesis to the point where he's endured so much to the point where now he could be an incredible blessing. Number four. Finally, number four. Be intentional about loneliness. Let me just read you one more verse before we're done. Verse 24. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Glory to God. Now, that's the kind of thing that in a reading plan of the Bible, you'd read over that. Nothing interesting there. She went off into seclusion, little detail. Not exactly life-changing. If you were called upon to preach anywhere, you probably wouldn't preach from that verse. It doesn't really seem to help anyone, except that it is very interesting. And let me tell you why. Because it was standard and culturally normal for a Jewish lady, when pregnant, to go into a very minor period of seclusion. But Luke's detail here tells us that this was much longer than normal because he tells us it was for five months. And the reason he's telling us that is just to highlight how unusual it was. Otherwise, we would just assume that it had happened. And this lends us really to verse 26. And again, I'll resist doing a Bible study with you. But in verse 26, uh, we have this, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel. That's read every Christmas. In the sixth month, remember that line? You've, how many of you have been Christians 20 years? You've heard that at least 20 times. Every Christmas. In the sixth month, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's nice, you know, June. <laughs> and you're sitting there thinking, why are we having Christmas in December? In the sixth month? In the sixth month of what? In the sixth month of the five months of her seclusion. Anyway, here's the point. In order to have something very special from God. It involved this. It involved loneliness. Separateness. Being away. When divine pregnancy occurs, you have to look after the baby. Do you know that, now forgive me, but do you know there are certain people that perhaps you shouldn't hang around with? Do you know that there are certain associations that you perhaps can't have? Did you know that? Did you know that as a Christian you can't do everything you want to do? 
Do you know that sometimes being holy means you have to lose a few friends? Now, if you lose them because you're a Pharisee and some sort of nasty, religious, bigoted monster, well, that's probably not what we mean here. Can I tell you this? The only people that lukewarm Christians uh, really impress are other lukewarm Christians. Not even the world likes them. We're not called to be cold or lukewarm. We're called to be hot. And in order to be hot, one has to be separated from the cold. Right now, in my garden, right now, something is being set up that I'm going to enjoy so much, it's called a shower. (laughs) Now, I won't be posting any pictures of this, but later on, uh, uh, we're going to have a shower, and there's going to be hot and cold mingled together to create something that's, you know, not going to burn me. You know that moment when you're in the hotel or maybe your own house when someone just turns a tap on downstairs and your shower water moves instantly to thermal death point (laughs) and you're singing away, oh what a beautiful morning, you know, and then suddenly the sound out the house, ah, you know, when someone turns on a cold tap somewhere else. It's hotter than the sun in here. Can I ask you this? Even as a church, it might, it might mean that you are on your own. Even as, a, even as a group of God's people. You know, sometimes there's so much compromise that can come into the church. I don't mean this church, but I talk about the church. That sometimes we might have to say, we are separate. We don't do that. And why? Because we're proud or arrogant? Or because we think more highly of ourselves than we ought? Not at all. It's for one, if it's a genuine reason, it's for one reason only. I have to protect the baby. She didn't go off into seclusion for her. She went off into seclusion because of John. And out of any great local church such as this one, there will come a John. I'm using that figuratively, right? In case someone here is called John and going, I knew it today. (laughs) Glory to God. I told them I was important. (laughs) Out of every local church, God wants to raise up a John. Uh, uh, We need, in this country, the hearts of the fathers to come back to their children. We need the disobedient to come back to the wisdom of the righteous. And, number three, we need to prepare the way of the Lord. Those are the three things, said John. But in order for that to happen, in order for this church to be effective, it's going to have to be separate. Everyone understand? So certain standards uh, can't be waved away. You can't break the Ten Commandments. They can only break you. In fact, they're not commandments. They're standards. You can only fail a standard. You can't break a standard. And so we need to be godly, don't we? We need to live right. We need to speak right. We need to think right. We need to repent of things. Stop talking about, well, I'm on the journey. Arrive! Get rid of stuff. Get rid of sin. Get rid of things that are harming you. Go into seclusion. So that God might be able to bring that glorious thing out of you to change the world. I'll finish with this. Very often, 
I'll stand in front of one of my Bible college classes and I'm, though things have changed for me a bit, I'm still doing a little bit of it still. And the, all the class are looking at me and some of, them are, some of them are tired and some of them are just a bit zoned out with loads of info and uh, others are just in love and hoping for coffee. You know, you can imagine the kind of, thing, <laughs> kind of thing. And I'll say this and I'll say it at least once every two weeks. I'll say we are not here to muck about. We are here to save our country. The government is not going to save our country. How many of you believe that? They don't even believe they're going to save the country. And they can't. The United States is not going to save our country. We definitely believe that. <laughs> right? The church is going to save our country. But a church that is under God's blessing, a church that is going to bring forth a John the Baptist ministry, that's what's going to save our country. So let me finish. Number one, in 2018, be faithful throughout all disappointments. They're going to come, sorry, but they are for you, for me. But live uprightly. Don't be defined by them. Have disappointment. Don't live as a disappointed person. Number two, be open to divine interference and be open to whatever that may be. Our God is working behind the scenes much more than you know. Number three, be prepared for God to have an incredibly long memory and for things that you prayed about to suddenly come about at the point where you think, I'm not even sure I deserve this. Or I'm not really ready for this now, like this old couple were. What did you pray about in 1998? What have you prayed about in the 90s and the 80s? What did you pray about five years ago? All these things will be fulfilled in their proper time. And number four, be intentional about loneliness. Make sure that you're separated from the things of this world for, uh, for the reason of the glory of God and so that you can protect that which is about to come flowing through you. Clean the pipe so when the water comes, it's not going to come tainted, but it's going to come as pure as a human can possibly allow it to flow. And number five, there is a fifth point, but it's only one line. It's a bit like the final question in question time, you know, the one at quarter to 11 or quarter to 12, whatever. Is number five, be ready for a happy ending because it ends happily. They have a baby. They're happy. They never sleep again, but they're happy. <laughs> and John the Baptist arrives on the scene and changes the earth. Why don't we stand together? Musicians, my dears. I'd love you just to play me something, but maybe no particular tune. And all I want, I'm not going to ask anyone to come out. I'm not going to do any drama here. All I want is to give you opportunity for you to respond to the Holy Spirit. And for you to say, yes, Lord. For you to say, yes. So just as the musicians play, let me ask you today whether you need to make a fresh commitment to in all of those moments of disappointment to not become disappointed or 
maybe you need to rejoice in God working behind the scenes. Then you need to be able to say, Lord, if you want to give me a baby, I'll have it. Whatever that might mean. Or if you want to say, Lord, I want to thank you that my prayers were not in vain. And that, Lord, you will answer in your proper time. Or maybe number four, you need to say, Lord, I know that you have great things for me and for this church. And I need to separate myself for your sake, for your glory, and for the sake of the John that is inside of me. And so just all over this room, why don't you lift your hands and musicians can play if you like. Uh, it's just to help. The Holy Spirit doesn't need music, but it helps us. And uh, so musicians just strum and play and just help us, just helps us. Over the room here, respond to the Lord. Father, I thank you Hallelujah. Move now, Holy Spirit. Come and blow among us. Lord, as people make decisions here today, we'll need your strength. We'll need your grace. Lord, we won't do anything by sheer will alone. Our will is weak. The flesh is weak even when our spirit is willing. And so now, Lord, I pray, may there be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit among us. Lord, cause decisions to be made now that will change our lives and will change the lives of others. Come on, tell the Lord. Here I am.